getting a positive SIBO test result back and realizing your symptoms weren't all in your head and that you can now actually start to move forward with healing can be such a relief. But with so many testing options, how do we make sure we get an accurate and reliable SIBO test result? My name is Bella and I'm a functional nutritionist and founder of the Functional Gut Health Clinic, where we help clients with SIBO and other digestive conditions take back control of their gut health. In our previous videos, we've discussed what SIBO is and the symptoms it can cause. So make sure you check those out if you've missed them. In the next video of our SIBO series, we're going to walk through why we test for SIBO, the different ways to test for SIBO, and the tests we use with clients in our clinic to get an accurate result. So why bother testing for SIBO? The short answer is test, don't guess. The longer answer is that symptoms of SIBO can overlap, not only between the different types of SIBO, but also with other gut conditions like parasites, bacterial infections, or yeast overgrowth as well as conditions like lactose intolerance and fructose malabsorption. Symptoms like bloating, constipation or diarrhea and abdominal pain aren't exclusive to SIBO. And so while they can help us identify SIBO as a possible cause, proper testing helps us clearly differentiate SIBO from these other imbalances and allows us to create targeted protocol recommendations that actually work. Not only that, but getting a clear, positive SIBO result after years of experiencing unexplained symptoms can be a massive relief. Just getting the validation that it's not all in your head, which is unfortunately something I experience myself and that we hear from clients all the time. Validation does wonders for your mental health. It also gives us a clear SIBO baseline to work from. Someone with really high gas levels and a very large or multi-organism overgrowth is likely going to take longer to clear it than someone with only slightly elevated gas levels and a single organism overgrowth. So test, don't guess, really does sum it all up for SIBO. The first type of SIBO testing is one used almost exclusively in the research setting. It's invasive, costly, and not practical in a clinical setting. It's known as an aspirate culture. This involves a procedure to take a sample from the small intestine to grow and identify bacteria and archaea. As a SIBO client, it's not something that you'll ever come across in your typical clinical setting, but you might read about it in the research papers. The main way we test for SIBO is with a breath test. It's the preferred method for SIBO testing because it's non-invasive, it's simple, and compared to an aspirate culture, it's pretty cost effective. It can also be done at home with a test kit that we send to your house from the lab. The way that breath testing works is we take a baseline breath sample, then we drink a sugar solution, and then we wait for the bacteria or archaea in our gut to start fermenting those sugars, which causes the gas production. We then take a breath sample every 15 to 20 minutes for three hours, which measures the type, timing, and amount of gas being exhaled to get a really clear picture of what's happening in the small intestine. If we get a rise or an elevation in hydrogen, methane or hydrogen sulfide gas within a certain period of time, then we have a positive SIBO breath test result. Basically, if you have an overgrowth of bacteria or archaea in your small intestine, they will take that sugar solution and they'll ferment it and they'll produce lots of gas. And then you'll breathe that out into the test tube every 15 to 20 minutes for the lab to measure and report on. As far as testing goes, it's one of the more complex ones to understand and complete. Now there are a few different breath testing options to consider and they relate to the lab or device you choose and the type of sugar solution that you use. The testing sugar options we have are lactulose, glucose, and fructose. Research on the different sugars and which is best is ongoing and different practitioners will have their preferred substrates but there are two different variables to consider when choosing which sugar to use. The first is how quickly it's absorbed in the small intestine. If you remember from our previous video about the anatomy of the small intestine, there are three sections. There's the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum, and we can get overgrowth in all three sections. So with this in mind, we ideally want a sugar that is not absorbed quickly at the start of the small intestine. We want one, that's not absorbed at all, or at least absorbed very slowly, to try and potentially feed an overgrowth of bacteria or archaea 
that occur through the whole six to seven meters of the small intestine. The second consideration is about picking a substrate that is actually fermented by the kinds of bacteria or archaea we're looking to identify. Not all microbes ferment all sugars. And so if you pick the wrong sugar substrate, the organism you have overgrowing in your small intestine might not actually ferment it and produce any gas, meaning we get a false negative SIBO result. So you have an overgrowth, it just doesn't show on your test. Here's a basic overview of the pros and cons of each sugar substrate and where we use one over the other. Lactulose is an artificial man-made sugar that humans can't digest. It basically passes unabsorbed through the small intestine and into the colon. This ability to pass through the whole small intestine without being absorbed is why it works so well as a SIBO testing option. It allows us to get a full assessment of the small intestine from top to bottom. But the challenge with lactulose is that it's only selectively fermented. That means that not all types of bacteria have the ability to eat it up. And if they don't eat it, then they don't produce gas. In this case, you could have bacteria in large amounts in your small intestine, but you won't see it on a lactulose breath test. And actually, lactulose has more traditionally been used as a prebiotic to feed up good gut bacteria like bifidobacteria and lactobacilli. But lactulose isn't really fermented by some of the more common gram-negative bacteria, including Klebsiella and E. coli, which we now list as the bacteria responsible for most of hydrogen-dominant SIBO. So this means we're potentially missing some of hydrogen-dominant SIBO cases when we use lactulose. It works really well for methane-dominant SIBO, which is caused by archaea because they have no issues fermenting lactulose, like crazy. Another drawback of lactulose is that it can trigger rapid transit time in some people. So lactulose testing can cause diarrhea very quickly for some people and give false positive test results. This is because it can move through the small intestine and into the large intestine too quickly in people who have rapid transit time. Once it hits the large intestine, where we're supposed to have lots of bacteria, then naturally we would start to produce a lot of gas. Normally, this doesn't happen until the 90 to 100 minute mark, or what we consider large intestine time. So we know that it's not the small intestine, but if transit time is too quick, it can look on a test result as if the gas is being produced in the small intestine when really it's already passed into the large intestine and is happening in the large intestine where it isn't SIBO. We'll talk more about this when we cover how to interpret a SIBO breath test lab result, but just know that if your practitioner is a SIBO expert, they should know how to not fall for this type of false positive result. Because it's not absorbable, lactulose is used as a laxative so some people may experience the need to use the bathroom during the test. Sometimes people will feel the same symptoms as why they're taking the SIBO breath test in the first place, like bloating and gas, but some don't experience any symptoms at all. So we don't really prefer to use lactulose in cases of suspected hydrogen dominant SIBO. Not only do the bacteria responsible for the overgrowth not like to ferment lactulose, but it can also exacerbate those diarrhea dominant symptoms given that it increases transit time and is used as a laxative. And a final note about the lactulose sugar substrate is that it's not the same as lactose. Lactose is the sugar from milk, while lactulose is a completely different sugar that is man-made. The lactulose that comes in the SIBO test kit is a 15 ml liquid solution that should be mixed into about eight ounces or one cup of water. This solution does contain 1.2 grams of lactose in it. So people who are severely lactose intolerant should ask their doctor if this test is right for them. The next option for SIBO breath testing is glucose. Unlike lactulose, glucose is highly absorbable. This means it really only measures bacterial overgrowth that exist in the upper part of the small intestine. This is because the glucose gets absorbed really quickly in the upper part of the small intestine, meaning it never makes it down the full six to seven meter length. So if the overgrowth you have is in the end or the distal part of the small intestine, in the ileum, for example, we wouldn't pick this up very well with a glucose breath test. It does mean though, that we don't have the same risk of false positive results that we see with lactulose because of the rapid transit time. In the case of glucose, the risk is a false negative result, as in you have SIBO, but it doesn't show up on testing because the sugar never makes it into where the bacteria are overgrowing. For this reason, we don't use glucose for SIBO testing very often, but if you did choose to use it, 
you would need to consume 75 grams of glucose mixed into eight ounces or one cup of water, which is a lot of glucose. Fructose is the last option and for a long time it wasn't very commonly used. But some recent research has changed all of that and has indicated that it can actually pick up SIBO in cases missed by both lactulose and glucose, particularly hydrogen dominant SIBO. This is because unlike lactulose, fructose is basically consumed by all types of bacteria and archaea. And unlike glucose, it's more slowly absorbed, which means that it will make its way into the middle part of the small intestine, the jejunum, and at least to some degree, the last part of the small intestine, the ileum. And in some clinical research done with all three sugar substrates, fructose was actually found to pick up SIBO in the most number of people tested. If you choose to test with fructose, you'll need to consume 25 grams of fructose mixed into eight ounces or one cup of water. Now you know about the test substrate options, let's briefly talk about the gases we're measuring and the lab and device options we have available. We're always wanting to measure hydrogen and methane gas. Less common is hydrogen sulfide gas, so you may like to add this on. There are conventional labs that measure hydrogen and methane gas levels. Then there is one lab which adds on hydrogen sulfide gas, which is actually very unstable and hard to measure, hence only one lab offering it. And then there are the devices that you can purchase that allows DIY SIBO testing like Food Marble. All of these options are useful and we have clients use them all. The only two cautions would be number one, that while hydrogen sulfide SIBO is less common if you suspect that you have it, it may be helpful for you to use the Gemelli Labs Trio Smart Test that includes this gas. And number two, that if you want to use lactulose as your testing substrate, it can be hard to get a medical prescription for this in the US and a few other countries. So which one do we use? Well, in an ideal world where money is not a constraint, we use both lactulose and fructose three-hour breath tests. Sometimes we include hydrogen sulfide gas and sometimes we don't. A client's budget and symptoms help us to make the decisions about this. But the reality is that money is often a constraint. And so what we found is that using different sugars for different types of SIBO works best. For suspected cases of methane SIBO or intestinal methanogen overgrowth or EMO as it's now known, we prefer to use lactulose. Because it's not absorbed, it means that we can be sure to pick up any archaea overgrowth right through the whole small intestine. And because methane traditionally presents as constipation, the potential laxative effect of lactulose is typically not a concern for most of these clients. And for hydrogen dominant SIBO or SIBO H, we tend to use fructose. This is because fructose is fermented by the bacteria we suspect are responsible for this type of bacterial overgrowth and because it's more slowly absorbed than glucose and can give us a good indication of where the overgrowth is occurring in the small intestine. Just remember that no test is perfect, but that using the right substrate can really improve your chances of getting an accurate result. In the next video, we'll talk about how to do a SIBO breath test, including the prep diet, and demonstrate with the test kit so that if your practitioner orders you a SIBO breath test, you know exactly what to do to get an accurate result.